In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our gospel text today from Matthew chapter 8 presents for us two great examples of faith. A leper came to Jesus and humbly petitioned him for healing and got it. And then a centurion soldier confidently approached Jesus and asked him to heal a servant, and he got what he asked too. Both of these accounts of the leper and the centurion are recorded for us in Scripture that we might be enticed and encouraged to believe likewise in Jesus Christ and to trust and hope in him for all help and deliverance. As we shall see, nothing pleases Jesus Christ more or moves him to compassion and action than trust in him from the heart. This text also teaches us that Jesus did not come to incite a social revolution or political rebellion. I've mentioned this in the past. In our text today, Jesus gave the Jewish and the Roman governments their due and did not try to change them. In fact, you could even say that he affirmed them. It's not as though Jesus commanded complete submission to human government. He always preached repentance and faith in the gospel at whatever the cost, even should it cause trouble and upheaval to government and family. And again, this distinction is critical to understand. Human government has its God-given place, but it has its limits. Let's leave that part of our text to the side for now. Because God is firstly teaching us again in this text what true faith is and how it operates on this earth. And he does it through the example of the leper and the centurion. Listen carefully then to the sermon, to the explanation of the gospel text. May we be encouraged to believe and trust in Christ and his word at whatever the cost. Now, the account of the leper and the centurion coming to Jesus asking for healing follows directly on the heels of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. He came down from the mountain. He was followed by great crowds, and a leper heard that he was nearby and fell down before him and begged him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, that is, if you so desire, you can make me clean. And notice immediately in the way the leper requested for healing this great important aspect of faith in Christ, that it's submissive, that it's humble. Submissive faith acknowledges that we cannot demand anything from God, but it leaves all petitions and requests to his gracious will. Now, should this leper have come to Jesus boasting about his works and how he had prayed so much and fasted so much and tithed so much and how God ought to listen and fulfill his petition because I've been good, then Jesus would not have listened to him because he would not have been relying on God's grace but on his own works. We see this happening with Jesus' parable of the Pharisee and tax collector in Luke's gospel, both the Pharisee and the tax collector came before God's altar to pray. And the tax collector prayed humbly and said, Lord, I'm a grievous sinner. Have mercy on me. Whereas the Pharisee prayed and boasted and said, Lord, I've tithed so much. I've prayed so much. I'm so glad I'm not like this tax collector over here. And Jesus said the tax collector went home justified, whereas the Pharisee did not. And so we can learn, like the leper in our text, to be humble to not come in boastfulness with demands, but rather petition God for mercy and kindness. Yes, there is the case of Neb, uh, Nehemiah who prayed to God and requested things and said, look how hard I've been working for you and doing what you want me to do. Please hear me now. 
but he still left things in God's hands. Indeed, should the leper have come with pharisaical boastfulness, Jesus would have thrown the law back at him and tell him he was not doing enough like he did to the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It sounds like an innocent request. But yet, because the rich young ruler was trusting in his own merits and righteousness, Jesus threw the law back at him and said, well, you know what the law says. Do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not murder. Rich young ruler said, I've, I've been doing all these. But Jesus said, yeah, well, go sell all your possessions and give to the poor and come and follow me. Kaboom. And the man couldn't do it. Jesus threw the law back at him. He was boastful in his heart. But the leper did not come with boasts like the Pharisee or the rich young ruler. He came with true and humble faith that submitted to the will of God, recognizing that he didn't deserve anything. And he also recognized that it just might be God's will for him to continue to suffer. But he knew that Jesus could heal him if he so wished. And God rewarded this leper's faith, faith by not throwing the law at him, but extending to him grace. First, he touched the man with his hand. What wonderful condescension. What wonderful grace and attention from the great God man. That would have been enough for the leprous man to go home happy. Jesus loves me. But glory upon glory, Jesus healed him. So it is, friends, we can learn from this text to approach Christ in prayer. Indeed, we must. God commands it. It does us no good to stew and complain in our afflictions. So let's be bold enough, like the leper and the centurion, to approach our Lord in prayer, to cry out to him, but let's approach him with humble submission. And not with boasting and demands. Let's learn from the leper to petition God for help in our afflictions, confident that he can help us, but leaving the matter in his hands. And we're taught this in the rest of Scripture. Consider Psalm 5 for a moment. In the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I lay my requests before you and wait and wait. In other words, we could paraphrase God's Admonition, encouragement to approach him in prayer, humbly, with this kind of paraphrase. Lord, here's my request. I don't deserve your attention in this matter. Nevertheless, I come boldly before you because I know of your mercy and grace. I know you can help and deliver me. Please do this thing for me, but I submit to your will and wait for your response. Let's move on now to the centurion. After mercifully hearing the leper and healing him, Jesus entered his hometown of Capernaum. The text says that. And there a Roman centurion heard about his arrival. Remember, Rome ruled the roost. There were troops in the promised land. Now this Roman soldier and centurion heard about Jesus' arrival and came up to him pleading that he would heal his servant who was paralyzed. And this is amazing that this Gentile Roman would show faith by going to the very one who could do something for him. He came to Jesus didn't offer incense to the pagan Roman gods. He didn't spend a fortune on doctors. It's remarkable that God would lead this uncircumcised pagan to Jesus and for help. And it's all the more remarkable when we consider that it's the Pharisees and Jewish teachers who refused to go to Jesus for help. They are the very ones who had God's word, who could preach the promises of the Messiah, who would do so much for him, them. They are the ones who conducted divine service. 
and had God's word, but they failed to go to him whom that word preached, Jesus Christ. They failed to go to him to find help in anything. And this ought to convict us. We Lutherans have the pure word and sacraments. We ought to be teachers of all Christendom because we understand best what Christ has done for us. It's there in our Lutheran confessions. It's there through all the incredibly good theology books that we have. But oh, how lazy we can be. And we prove our laziness by lack of attention to God's word, by our lack of prayer and instead looking elsewhere for help in our afflictions instead of Christ. And the Baptists and the Evangelicals whom you have heard me criticize their theology from the pulpit here who don't have the pure word, but they have enough of it and confidently believe and trust in Christ through their simplicity can shame so many of us Lutherans and chastise us for our laziness and lack of faith. And so could this Gentile centurion chastise and rebuke the Jews of his day for their lack of faith in Christ. You're the ones who have God's word. You should be believing in him, like me. Now, there are three things to genuine faith that we can see, especially in the centurion. We've already learned that true faith submits to the gracious will of God. We learned this from the leper. But we can learn two other elements of true, genuine faith. First, consider that the centurion's uh, faith was humble. That is, he didn't want Jesus to even come under his roof. He knew he was unworthy and said, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. We should too, likewise, recognize our unworthiness. Indeed, without recognition of our sin, our lack of holiness, there can be no true faith in Jesus Christ. We're not worthy because of our sinfulness, of anything good from God, and yet true faith recognizes this, laments it, but it doesn't despair. The true believer has this incredible contrast of recognizing unworthiness and yet trusting in God's mercy for help. This is what the centurion teaches us about faith. Teaches us to lament our sin and unworthiness, but to trust in Christ and to not despair. Consider this psalm uh, from Psalm 147. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. What a contrast in our heads of those two things. Who fear God and recognize our sinful unworthiness and yet to recognize his love for us in Christ. And trust in that. And what a treat then that we have who follow the historic lectionary or uh, liturgy that we have in our liturgy itself. This great distinction between our unworthiness and yet our trust in God's love to absolve us and give us what we need. We have it in our confession and absolution. We confess all together that each one of us are poor, miserable sinners, and yet we wait for the pastor to say, in the stead and by the command of Christ, I forgive you all your sins. Hallelujah. This is what is taught for us in our text today. 
recognition of unworthiness, trust in God's mercy in Christ. Let's continue with everything that the centurion said to Christ. Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. And here we learn another aspect of true faith that's knowledgeable. It recognizes who Jesus truly is and what he can do. It's not childish. It's not ignorant. The centurion, pagan though he was, or pagan as he once was, he demonstrated his faith. This centurion knew that Jesus was divine and was no ordinary man. Even the Pharisees who had the scriptures couldn't get this. Consider that the centurion would have heard about Jesus and understood from the reports he heard about this Jesus that Jesus had to have been divine. He was no ordinary man. And the centurion listened to these reports of Jesus, listened to some decent preaching, you could say, of Jesus and allowed it to inform and transform him transform him into someone with great and humble faith this is what preaching is meant to do to inform us and to transform us by our reception of it people hear the preached word and gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ to this day and think about it and evaluate and according to the mercy of God believe and are saved This is how salvation happens. The Apostle Paul says so in Romans 10. How are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? We can assume that there would have been much for this once pagan centurion to learn from the Holy Scriptures and even the godless Pharisees could have taught him many things, but the centurion was a careful listener. And he understood from the preaching and the reports of Jesus that this carpenter from Nazareth was a divine man man, and I'm going to associate myself with him and I'm going to cling to him by faith. I'm going to trust in him and his word. Oh, that we would be such careful listeners as the Roman centurion in our text and that our faith would be so informed and knowledgeable as this Gentile believer who understood the reports and preaching of Jesus and allowed it to inform his thinking. A third aspect of the Roman centurion's faith is his confidence. True faith does not waver at whether God is powerful enough to do this or that. It does not doubt that God is merciful and kind. Rather, true faith trusts that God's word is powerful to create and destroy, heal, and save. Test yourselves in this. Consider your own prayers. Do you pray with confidence that God is going to hear you? Or do you pray with wavering, thinking maybe God will hear me, maybe not? The centurion was confident. He was certain that Jesus was merciful He was confident that Jesus needed only to say the word and that healing would be done. His faith did not waver. And his confident faith was rewarded with the very thing he asked for, the healing of the servant. Compare the Canaanite woman whose faith was confident and who persisted in her cries for Jesus' attention to heal her daughter, knowing that he could. 
provided she kept believing and kept up her prayers, God would answer. Oh, that we would have such confidence and believe God's word without wavering. This goes for law texts, such as when Jesus says in 1 Corinthians 6 that the sexually immoral idolaters, adulterers, thieves, and so on, will not inherit the kingdom of God, knowing that he means what he says, but it means especially so that God grants forgiveness and absolution from the pastor when they confess that God hears our prayers and will answer us and deliver us from all afflictions. In this life, perhaps, but especially in the next. We cannot doubt God's love for us in Christ. To doubt it is disastrous. Hear James cry then to not doubt and become like waves or bending branches. Be strong in your confidence like the, the centurion. Now the last thing to notice today in our gospel text that I mentioned earlier is uh, Jesus didn't come to start revolutions and rebellions. He affirmed Jewish and Roman governments when the leper was uh, healed. Jesus affirmed Jewish government by saying, go do what you're supposed to do. Get that approval from the Jewish priests that you can come back into society. Likewise, when Jesus approached the Roman centurion, he didn't say a word about the bloodthirsty Roman government that he worked for and how they oppressed people. He didn't say a word. But we do know from our text that while Jesus didn't come to upend governments, he has made it clear that he wants his word to spread. He wants people to hear it and he wants people to believe it and live a holy life according to it. And we know from Scripture that when people and governments do refuse Christ and the preaching of his word, then revolution and social change will eventually come. But it's something that God does on his own, and we should not plan it out or expect it. May God grant us, friends, faith in Christ, like the leper and the centurion who humbly came to him confident and informed about who Christ is and God's gracious will in Christ. Amen. Amen. The peace of God that transcends all understanding. Guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.